Howdy, and welcome to lecture number 26 for Mean 315, Principles of Thermodynamics. Okay, so we've got a lot to go through today, lots of really cool and fun stuff, so let's just go ahead and get started. Uh, to begin, a couple of announcements. First of all, uh, homework number 11, as we talked about in lecture number 25, is assigned and is due on Tuesday, December 3rd, which is the last day of class. Uh, there is nothing due on Tuesday, November 26th, uh, except for uh, reminder number two, which is your participation assessment. And the participation assessment on Tuesday, November 26th, which is lecture number 27, the next lecture that we'll have together in person, is a graded participation assessment. So uh, again, you have to get uh, the responses correct in order to get credit for the participation assessment. The content of that participation assessment will cover lecture number 25 and this lecture, lecture number 26 material. Reminder number three, your project report is due on Tuesday, December 3rd, the last day of class. Uh, so hopefully all of you are pretty close to wrapping that up and will be able to uh, submit uh, uh, your work on Tuesday, December 3rd. Reminder number four, is that the course evaluation, the end of the semester evaluation, is being conducted online using the PICA system. We won't be doing any paper-based evaluation. Uh, it's going to be done online. So uh, the way that you do this is you go to pika.tamu.edu, and when you log in with your NetID, you'll see Mean315 listed there, and uh, you should be able to complete the course evaluation. Uh, you'll be asked the same 12 questions that you get asked on the paper evaluation, and you'll also have an opportunity to put written comments. Uh, so I do strongly encourage you to do this evaluation. In fact, you can go ahead and hit the pause button right now on the lecture and go to pika.tamu.edu and fill out the evaluation. So go ahead and hit pause and do that right now. Okay, welcome back from doing the uh, course evaluation. So reminder number five is uh, actually a correction to the last lecture, the last online lecture, lecture number 25. Uh, someone uh, pointed out an error to me through the discussion board on page 25.5 of the lecture notes. And so if I just go back to that real quickly, I just zoomed in, oops, this is not what I want to do, there we go. So this was page 25.5 where we were talking about the uh, relationship between the uh, work transfer and the negative VDP term, what we call shaft work. And down at the very bottom is where I made the mistake. I said that delta W is equal to the integral from 1 to 2 of DH. Uh, that, in fact, is, is incorrect. That should be integral from 1 to 2 of negative DH is equal to uh, integral from 1 to 2 of negative VDP. <clears throat> and so, in fact, what we get is uh, we do not get H2 minus H1 is equal to negative V P2 minus P1. It's, in fact, H1 minus H2. Now, uh, in my uh, uh, great idea, uh, I thought that I would make this correction in red ink. But then, of course, when I took it to the hotel scanning machine, uh, it only scans in black and white. So. I used color all throughout this lecture, red pen, to highlight some really cool things, and uh, it was all just for naught. Uh, so anyway, I'll still be able to point it out to you where, where I'm using red pen so that it's a little bit easier for you to identify. But please do make a note of this, uh, of this error in lecture 25.5, page 25.5 from lecture number 25. Also, the other good news is that I'm not as jet lagged tonight as I was uh, when I recorded lecture number 25, so hopefully uh, my speech will not be uh, slurred or, or uh, 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 make silly mistakes, and, and I should be able to take the full 75 minutes tonight as well, so we'll, we'll see. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to talk about today is uh, something which we call the reheat cycle. So if you remember in lecture number 25, we talked about uh, different types of vapor power cycles, and one of the vapor, you know, the, the most common vapor power cycle is the Rankine cycle, which is the simple steam power plant. And then we said that a variation to the Rankine cycle is the reheat cycle. And there's several more variations to the Rankine cycle, but I, I like to point out the reheat cycle uh, for a couple of reasons. One, um, people 
uh, will expect you to at least have heard of it uh, when you graduate. Uh, two, it's uh, a way to show how we can improve upon cycle efficiency just by uh, the way that we design the cycle itself. And then three, it helps us understand the uh, Carnot cycle a little bit better. Uh, so it, it, this, this discussion will be placed in the context of the Carnot cycle. So uh, the, uh, the, the basic idea of the reheat cycle is to increase the heat engine efficiency. So we already talked about on, in lecture 25 that the Rankine cycle will not have an efficiency as high as the Carnot cycle operating between the same TH and TL reservoirs. Uh, and so the reheat cycle is basically a, a trick, if you will, to try and get uh, the, the vapor power cycle uh, efficiency closer to the Carnot cycle. It won't equal the Carnot cycle, but, but we at least can get it closer. Okay, so let's start with this question. What's the typical problem, or what's the problem with the typical Rankine cycle? Okay, well, let's take a look at the Rankine cycle TS diagram, right? And now this is this was where I had used colored ink, red ink. So um, what I want you to pay attention to first are where I have uh, the Rankine cycle drawn. So on the TS diagram, we have TH, the high temperature reservoir. We have TL, the low temperature reservoir. But because this is a practically operating cycle, the Rankine cycle, um, our low temperature in the cycle will be higher than the low temperature reservoir so that we can reject thermal energy to the low temperature sink. And our high temperature in the cycle will be lower than the high temperature reservoir's temperature so that we can accept thermal energy from the high temperature reservoir into the cycle. So the Rankine cycle drawn between TH and TL starts off at state one where we're a saturated liquid we then undergo reversible and adiabatic or isentropic um, pressure increase from state one to state two. We then have our constant pressure heat addition process from state two up to state three. And this is where we reach our maximum temperature in the cycle at state three. We then expand the mixture through reversible and adiabatic means from state three to state four. And then we have constant pressure heat rejection uh, from state four back to state one. And in this diagram here, state four is a little bit in the two-phase region, which is okay. I mean, most turbines can accommodate around, you know, a, a, anywhere greater than 90% quality of steam. If you start going below 90% quality of steam, then you start running into cond uh, condensation issues on, on the turbine blades. So this area here that I have hash marked is the Rankine cycle. Okay, well, what would the Carnot cycle look like in this same scheme? Well, the Carnot cycle, first of all, is going to operate exactly between TL and TH. Remember, all the processes of the Carnot cycle are reversible, so the heat addition process at TH will occur at TH. The cycle temperature has to be the same as the reservoir temperature in order for it to be externally reversible. Remember, we can't have heat transfer through a finite temperature difference. Likewise, on the low temperature side, the low temperature of the cycle is the same as the low temperature reservoir. And again, that's a necessity for the Carnot cycle to be reversible. It has to be externally reversible, which means that thermal energy cannot be transferred through a gradient. There can be no gradient between the cycle and the reservoir during the heat transfer processes. Okay, so uh, this box here that you see is the Carnot cycle on the TS diagram. So we start here uh, where, where the little hand is and we undergo reversible and adiabatic temperature increase, right? So constant entropy from TL to TH. We then have constant temperature heat addition. We then have reversible and adiabatic temperature decrease from TH to TL and we then have constant temperature heat rejection. So if we now look at the Carnot cycle in a little bit more detail, we see that uh, because it's a reversible cycle, totally reversible, there's no net change in entropy. There's no entropy generation. So based on second law, that tells us that QH is equal to TH times delta S. Where did I get this from? Well, remember that delta S is equal to 
uh, delta Q divided by T. And since T is constant, when we take the integral, we can pull that T out and uh, then manipulate this expression, or excuse me, manipulate the second law to get this expression where we're solving for QH rather than solving for delta S. So the high, the, the high temperature thermal energy input is equal to the high temperature times the change in entropy delta S. Likewise, the low temperature heat rejection is equal to TL times the same change in entropy, right? This, this is the same delta S that we have here. <clears throat> so if we look at the first law now for any cycle, right? This is the first law for any heat engine cycle we get that the network is equal to QH minus QL. For the Carnot cycle, we can substitute these two expressions, TH delta S and TL delta, TL delta S, into our first law equation and get that the network is equal to TH times delta S minus TL times delta S. And so the network is equal to the difference in temperatures times the change in entropy. So what that means is the following. This area that's bounded between this top line and this bottom line is the net work that the Carnot cycle produces, right? It's the net heat transfer, and since the first law says that the cyclic integral of heat transfer equals the cyclic integral of work transfer, the area between these two curves is exactly equal to the net work. Well, because of that cyclic integral, that first law statement, we can say the same thing, uh, almost the same thing, uh, for the Rankine cycle. And so this hashed mark that we have here is the network, the ideal network, that is transferred for the Rankine cycle. So this whole area is the work transfer for the Carnot cycle, and this work transfer, or this area is the work transfer for the Rankine cycle, a lot smaller, right? So it's very clear that the Rankine cycle produces a lot less net work for a given TH and TL than if the cycle could operate as the Carnot cycle between the same TH and TL. So what would we like to do? Well, we would like to get the Rankine cycle area to occupy as much of the Carnot cycle area as we possibly can. So how would we do that? Well, what would be ideal is for us to elevate the state two pressure as high as we can so that we can essentially make uh, the change in entropy smaller, right? So we want to basically squeeze this box in and kind of cut out this area here, okay? Uh, and so we can do that by raising state two to a higher pressure which would then mean that we come to state three, maybe, you know, maybe we get to uh, state three real shortly after uh, uh, the um, saturation dome, okay? So let's see what, uh, what happens when we do that. Okay, so this is what we're talking about doing here in this diagram here. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make the Rankine cycle fill more of the Carnot cycle area so that the Rankine cycle work transfer is closer to the ideal work transfer, which is the Carnot cycle work transfer. So what did I do? Well, if I get both of these diagrams on the screen together, which I guess I can't do, um, but anyway, what I did is I increased the pressure at state two, which means I also increased the pressure at state three. Okay, so Look at how much higher state two comes in this diagram than compared to this diagram, right? State two is down here, further away from state three, whereas down or in this in this diagram, state two is much higher, uh, placing the uh, state two temperature closer to the state three temperature. So because of that higher pressure, remember process two to three is a constant pressure process. So that elevates the pressure at state three. And so we increase our, temp uh, our pressure, and then we start to add thermal energy. But we realize that we can only elevate state three up to T3, right? Remember, this T3 is fixed. This is limited by whatever TH is, and that 
necessary practical gradient that has to exist in order to actually transfer the thermal energy from the high temperature reservoir into the cycle. So T3 is fixed and I've elevated uh, state 3 pressure and so I reach my state 3 much sooner, right? So I, I might in fact be able to add enough thermal energy that my state 3 is a saturated vapor, okay? So now uh, I've done what I wanted to do, right? My, my Rankine cycle area now fills much more of the Carnot cycle area, right? So looking at these, this diagram here, this space up here between TH and T3 is the lost work opportunity uh, resulting from the Rankine cycle not being the Carnot cycle. And likewise, this space down here between temperature 1 and TL, T1 and TL, is also lost work opportunity, resulting from the Rankine cycle not being a Carnot cycle. So take a look at these two images, and then look back up here, right? And you see that this area, so this is the lost work potential. These two areas are the lost work potential. These areas are much larger in this arrangement than in this arrangement. So I did what I wanted to do. I've increased my work output from my Rankine cycle by elevating state two pressure, which elevated state three pressure. But what's happened, right? What, what other issue that have I now introduced? Well, look at where state four is. State four is well within the saturation region where quality here is going to be somewhere around 50 to 60% and that creates serious problems for turbines, right? I now am condensing the substance through the turbine quite substantially, and we know that this is a problem because turbines are designed for single phase flow only. And as I mentioned above, or before, you know, they can maybe tolerate around 90% quality, but if you start going below that, you're gonna start creating mechanical problems on the turbine blades. So what do we do? We're sort of caught in a quandary here where we uh, would like to be able to fill this gap of the Carnot cycle, but we also have to be able to allow our turbines to practically survive this cycle. What do we do? Well, this is where the reheat cycle comes in. Okay, so what we do is we reheat the water after it's been partially expanded. So in other words, what we're going to do is we're still going to elevate state 2 to a higher pressure than what we would have raised it to in this diagram here. And we'll uh, add thermal energy until we get to state 3, which is limited by the temperature at state 3. We'll then partially expand it to a point, but then we'll reheat it so that we remove the quality from the mixture and then fully expand it. Okay. So what does this look like? Well, this is, this is what the reheat cycle looks like in terms of devices. We have the high temperature reservoir, and the high temperature reservoir will provide thermal energy during the initial heating stage, which is going to be indicated by QH prime, as well as during the reheat stage, which I've indicated as QH double prime. So what does this reheat stage look like, and, and how do we actually do this? Well, <clears throat> the first part of the cycle looks very similar to the typical Rankine cycle. We start off at state one, we're saturated liquid at state one, we go through the pump process, we add work to the pump process, and the pump increases our pressure from state one up to state two. We then go through the initial heating process where we boil the water at constant pressure uh, and uh, add QH prime, thermal energy to the system, and then we end up at state three, where we're now at high pressure and high temperature. We then expand that mixture through the first turbine, which is often called the high pressure stage turbine. And this first turbine, which I've indicated as T1 with a bar over it, I do that so that uh, we don't confuse that T1 with temperature. So T bar one is, is turbine number one. And turbine number one produces a certain amount of work, which I've labeled as work T-bar one. We don't fully expand that mixture, though. 
If we were to do that, we would start condensing the mixture through the, excuse me, we'd start condensing the water through the turbine, creating excessive amounts of quality, which would then damage the turbine. So before we start generating too much quality in the substance, we uh, stop expanding it through the turbine, and so the, the water leaves the turbine, and it's now at what we call state four. It then goes through a reheat process where thermal energy QH double prime is added to the substance, to the water. And so we now leave at state five at the same temperature as state three. So we reheat the water back up to the state three temperature. But because we're at a lower pressure, because we had expanded the water through this first stage turbine, we're at now what is called state five. So state five has the same temperature as state three, but it has a lower pressure than state three. We then fully expand this water through the second stage turbine, which is often called the low pressure turbine. And so I've labeled this as T bar two. And as we expand from state five to state six, we then uh, produce a, uh, um, a certain amount of work, which I've labeled as WT bar two, the work of uh, the second turbine. The final process is, is the same as the regular Rankine cycle. As we go from state six to state one, we reject thermal energy, and that thermal energy is Q sub L, and we reject it to the low temperature reservoir TL. So we have two new processes in the reheat cycle compared to the Rankine cycle. These two new processes, the first one is, we call it process four to five, and this is the constant pressure reheat process. And then we have process five to six, which is our reversible and adiabatic pressure decrease through this second stage turbine. All the other processes are the same. The one exception is that in the simple Rankine cycle, what we call process four to one is actually in the reheat cycle process six to one. So the uh, constant pressure heat rejection process in the reheat cycle is process six to one. Okay, so just to clarify some of the labels that I've used in this diagram, T bar one is of course the high pressure turbine and T bar two is the low pressure turbine. And one thing to make a note of is that when we calculate the network of the cycle, this is the uh, turbine, the, the work output from turbine number one, the work output for, from turbine number two, uh, and then plus the pump work, but of course the pump work is, is a negative number, and so that will of course uh, diminish the net work from the cycle. <clears throat> QH prime is the thermal energy that's transferred in the initial heating process, so this is uh, during process two to three, so QH prime is the same as Q two to three. And then QH double prime is the thermal energy that's transferred in the reheat process, which is process four to five. So QH double prime is the same as Q four to five. And then we can define efficiency the same way that we defined it for the Rankine cycle. Efficiency is the network divided by QH total. And so we've defined Q, uh, excuse me, we've defined W net. And of course, QH total is QH prime plus QH double prime. <clears throat> okay, so does this really make an improvement? Do, can we actually see this improving efficiency on the TS diagram? Well, let's take a look. So uh, this is our TS diagram for the reheat cycle, and we're also going to be able to show what the Rankine cycle would have looked like for these same temperatures and uh, a uh, similar reheat pressure. So we, of course, have TH and TL, and again, if, if you were able to see my red ink, you would see that we've got the Carnot cycle scribed out here. So the Carnot cycle is uh, the square that goes between TL to TH and then TH back down to TL. We then have the reheat cycle drawn on here. So the reheat cycle, uh, we have process 1 to 2, which is our reversible and adiabatic uh, pressure increase, our pump process. So we increase to a very high pressure, pressure at state two. We then add thermal energy at constant pressure at this high pressure from state two to state three. We then undergo partial expansion 
from state 3 to state 4, so this is the first turbine, the high pressure turbine, we then reheat the water at constant pressure back up to the state 3 temperature, so st uh, temperature at state 3 is the same as the temperature at state 5, so now we're up here at state 5, and then we fully expand the water from state 5 back down to state 6. And now notice that with this scheme, nowhere in here do we enter the saturation region during the expansion process, so we keep our turbine safe. And we complete the cycle during our constant pressure heat rejection process from state 6 back to state 1. Okay, so that's the reheat cycle. What if we were to do the Rankine cycle? Well, the Rankine cycle would have to, remember, we have to heat up to temperature uh, at state 3. But because the Rankine cycle would have, uh, you know, we have to keep state 6, basically, you know, in the Rankine cycle, this would be state 4. We have to keep the turbine exhaust water out of the saturation region. We can only raise the pressure at state 2 of the Rankine cycle to a certain level. And so we'll raise it to state 2 prime. So state 2 prime here is the uh, Rankine cycle. Okay, and so we would then have our reversible and adiabatic pressure increase from 1 to 1 prime. We'd then have our constant pressure heat addition process from 2 prime up to 5. And then we would have our reversible and adiabatic expansion from 5 down to 6. And then we have our uh, constant pressure heat rejection process from 6 back to 1. So if we take a look at what the Rankine cycle has done for us, right, so look at Look at what the Rankine cycle would have been. I'm scri scribing it out with the little hand here. That's what the Rankine cycle would have given us. But now the reheat cycle is giving us this extra nugget, right? It's giving us this extra area to fill in this void <clears throat> between the Rankine cycle and the Carnot cycle. So this hash marked area here is that's bound between 2 prime, 2 three, four, back to two prime, this area here is the work that is gained by implementing the reheat cycle relative to the Rankine cycle. So we definitely see an improvement in efficiency. So how do we actually solve this? Well, uh, the standard assumptions of the reheat cycle are very similar to the Rankine cycle. And then there's just a couple of additional items that we need to bear in mind. First, the same as the Rankine cycle, state 1 is typically a saturated liquid at a temperature of T1. So this is the same state 1 condition as the Rankine cycle. Uh, the pressure at state 4 uh, is equal to the pressure at state 5. So that reheat process is a constant pressure process. And one of those pressures, either pressure 4 or pressure 5, is either given or in some way you're able to determine it. It's in some way known. Remember that the uh, temperature at state 5 after the reheat process is the same as the temperature at state 3, right? That's limited basically to the um, heat transfer of the of the boiler. And then of course just remember that your QH, your, your heat input, is uh, the sum of Q2 to 3 plus Q4 to 5. And your net work of course is the sum of work 1 to 2 that's your pump work, plus work three to four. That's your first stage turbine work, plus work four to f or plus work five to six. That's your second stage work process. <clears throat> okay, so that's the reheat cycle, right? Just uh, a really neat, creative way to increase the efficiency of a cycle uh, while considering some of the practical limitations of not letting a turbine uh, suffer a condensing substance. Okay, so we're actually going to switch gears now, and uh, we're going to start talking about the uh, non-vaporizing power cycle. So again, on, in lecture 25, if you remember, I had that little block diagram of cycle analysis, and the uh, you know the the left-hand branch was for heat engine cycles, and and then the first uh, sub branch from that was vapor power cycles, so that would be things like Rankine and reheat cycles. 
And then the uh, second box is uh, what we call the air standard power cycles or the air standard heat engine cycles. And so that's what we're going to start talking about today. So uh, air standard heat engine cycles are those that use air as the working substance. It's one of the few times in thermodynamics when we actually name something that, that is true to what it is and, and makes sense. When we say air standard heat engine cycle, it means that we're using air as the working substance. And there's three very popular air standard heat engine cycles. The first two uh, you may have heard of already uh, is uh, the first one is called the auto cycle. And the second one is called the diesel cycle. Now the auto and the diesel cycle are both closed system cycles, which means that they use piston cylinder arrangements uh, in a reciprocating fashion uh, in the heat engine cycle. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. The third popular air standard heat engine cycle is the Brayton cycle. Uh, the Brayton cycle is different than the auto and the diesel cycles in the sense that uh, it is an open system cycle. So it's composed of open processes just like the Rankin cycle is composed of open processes. But unlike the Rankin cycle, which was also a closed cycle, right? In other words, um, it's a closed loop. The Rankin cycle operates in a closed loop. You can actually construct a, a situation where the Brayton cycle is an open cycle as well, right? Because air is the working substance. So you suck air in uh, to the compressor stage and you exhaust the air out uh, to the atmosphere after the turbine stage um, because it's just air. You wouldn't do that with the Rankine cycle, of course, because it's a little bit harder to come by water uh, in an atmospheric type situation. So um, the, the Brayton cycle is, is not only composed of open system or open processes, but the cycle itself can also be open. But most of the time it's closed, just, just so that you know. Okay, so we're going to, before we dig real deep into the details of the, we're, we're, we're only going to spend some real uh, invested time with the auto and the diesel cycle. We're unfortunately not going to have enough time to uh, spend a lot on the Brayton cycle. But before we dig into the, the nitty-gritty details of the auto and the diesel cycle, I, I, I want to take a brief tangent and, and rectify uh, some issues that, that are very pervasive in a first course on thermodynamics. And, and now we have uh, this huge dissemination of bad information, uh, which as a thermodynamicist, and particularly one who studies internal combustion engines, is... Uh, perfectly unacceptable to me. So let me let me read to you um, three statements that you will probably either find on the internet, um, you'll, you, you actually will find them in your textbook, uh, or you'll, you'll hear people say these things when you talk to them about engines. Uh, they'll say, for example, that the auto cycle models gasoline or spark ignition engines. Um, you'll hear them say, uh, and, and of course this actually makes sense, the diesel cycle models diesel engines. And you'll hear them say Brayton cycle models gas turbines and jet engines. Okay, So the reality is, is that all three of these statements, when we talk about auto cycle, diesel cycle, and Brayton cycle as heat engine cycles, they're all wrong. Every single statement is wrong. The auto, cycle heat, the auto heat engine cycle does not model a gasoline engine or a spark ignition engine. The diesel heat engine cycle does not model a diesel engine, and the Brayton heat engine cycle does not model a gas turbine or a jet engine. And uh, I'll talk about why that is in just a moment. Get, you know, uh, I'll talk about that in just a moment. But before I do that, I, I do want to point out, you know, it's pretty, it's probably pretty clear to you the connection between the uh, what is called the diesel heat engine cycle and, and its uh, interpretation as modeling a diesel engine, right, since they're both diesel. Um, but it may not be clear to you why the auto heat engine cycle is often associated with gasoline or spark ignition engines. Uh, and uh, just to give you some background information, so of course, you know Rudolf Diesel invented the diesel engine. Uh, that's, that's pretty well established. He was 
one of the few fortunate people that actually was able to have what he worked on named after him. Otto, uh, Nikolai Otto, uh, is actually known for inventing the four-stroke engine. So actually, the not, not the very first uh, manifestation of the internal combustion engine, but the first manifestation of the four-stroke cycle of the internal combustion engine was developed by Nikolai Otto. Now, what's also curious about this is that uh, Nikolai Otto uh, is, is essentially came up with the mechanical components or the, the mechanical operation of the four-stroke internal combustion engine about two years after a Frenchman by the name of Lemur uh, came up with a, a working design or, or a, what I'll call a paper design of the four-stroke engine. Now, as the story goes, Nikolai Otto uh, claims he had no idea about the Frenchman's design and that his design was original uh, in his own ideas. Uh, but of course, uh, the French had something else to say about that. Regardless, you know who won the battle, right? It's it's named the Otto cycle, uh, and it's not named the the uh, Lenoir cycle. So, um, like I say, I guess you know who won that battle. So, all right. Anyway, why are these statements wrong? Okay, and why do I get hung up on this? Okay, well, the reason why these statements are wrong is for the following reason: internal combustion engines. So uh, things like gasoline engines, diesel engines, gas turbine engines, jet engines. These are all internal combustion engines. What does that mean? It means that the engine is inducting fuel in an oxidizer, which is, depending on the engine, if it's a gasoline engine, it's, it's inducting gasoline and air. Gasoline is the fuel and air is the oxidizer. And it's actually burning that fuel. It's, it's having that combustion take place inside the uh, same thermodynamic control system that will convert that chemical energy into useful work, okay? So you'll notice that there's no heat transfer that takes place from the surroundings to the system, which occurs with a heat engine, okay? So uh, because of that, internal combustion engines are not heat engines. They're not, they're not receiving their energy from the surroundings in the form of heat transfer. They're receiving their energy from their surroundings in the form of chemical energy. The other probably more fundamental reason, though, is for the following fact, and that is that internal combustion engines do not operate on a thermodynamic cycle. So if you remember, very early on, we defined a heat engine as being a cyclic device that takes thermal energy and converts it into work energy. Internal combustion engines violate that definition of being a cyclic device. They're mechanically cyclic, right? They, they follow a mechanical cycle, but they don't follow a thermodynamic cycle. Well, what does that mean? Well, remember that a thermodynamic cycle is defined as being a collection of processes where after the last process, the system is returned to its initial state, the start of the first process. Well, how does that work with a heat engine? Well, suppose we have an air standard power cycle, right? Maybe it's an open Brayton cycle, for example. And at the initial state, that heat engine will use air, and maybe it'll start at atmospheric temperature and atmospheric pressure. The heat engine then does its stuff, works its magic, does its processes, and at the end of the heat engine cycle, we'll still have air. And it'll be back to the atmospheric temperature, and it'll be back to the atmospheric pressure. In other words, it operates on a cycle. What about an internal combustion engine? Well, we start with fuel, and we start with our oxidizer, which is usually air, and maybe both of these things are at atmospheric temperature and pressure, and the IC engine inducts this fuel and air, and it does its thing. It undergoes processes, right? But coming out the tailpipe, what's leaving the IC engine is not fuel and air. It's products of combustion. It's things like carbon dioxide and water and, you know, a bunch of other species that, unfortunately, we don't get a chance to talk about this semester. And even if these products of combustion eventually cool back down to the initial temperature and pressure of the reactants, they'll never go back to the reactants, right? Combustion is an irreversible process. 
So we can't go back spontaneously from CO2 and water to fuel and air. So an internal combustion engine does not operate on a thermodynamic cycle. Therefore, an internal combustion engine is not a heat engine. Okay, so why do I get so hung up on this? This seems like a really nuanced thing to, 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 to care about. And, and, you know, is Jacob so desperate that, you know, this is, this is, what, he, this is what he talks about now is how IC engines are not, are not heat engines. Well, it is important. At least I think it's important. The reason why it's important to distinguish the two is because the maximum efficiency of an IC engine is not equal to a Carnot efficiency like what exists for a heat engine. In other words, if you want to know what the maximum efficiency of a heat engine is, you have to know the temperatures of the low and high temperature reservoirs. And the Carnot efficiency is 1 minus TL over TH. This statement here is not true for an internal combustion engine because an IC engine is not a heat engine. And in fact, we know based on the Kelvin Planck statement that this efficiency must be less than 100%. And it turns out that because an IC engine is taking chemical energy and converting it to work energy, the theoretical maximum efficiency of an IC engine is actually 100%. It's not limited by the Kelvin Planck statement. That's not to say that the IC engine violates the second law or that entropy isn't generated. Absolutely entropy is generated, and that's why, in fact, that typical efficiencies of IC engines are less than 100%. But if you were to construct completely reversible processes, your maximum efficiency of an IC engine would be 100%. Now, we haven't done that yet. We haven't conceived those connections, those collections of reversible processes. But based on our uh, other areas of understanding of thermodynamics, we know this statement to be true. Okay? Okay, so that's the end of my tangent. Uh, I'll step off my soapbox now and uh, bring us back to heat engine cycles. We, we will only be discussing heat engine cycles in this class. Unfortunately, we won't, we won't have any time aside from what I just said uh, to talk about internal combustion engines. But of course, if you're ever interested in talking about that with me or anything related to thermodynamics or, or anything at all, really, just, just come and see me. Okay, so let's return now to the auto and the diesel cycles. And the auto and the diesel cycles are so incredibly similar that I'm going to describe them together and I'll point out the differences between the two. But they're, they're really, really similar. In fact, there's really only one process that's different between the two. So it makes a lot of sense to talk about them together. Okay, so uh, as we talked about above, the auto and diesel cycles are both closed system cycles. Okay, and as I just mentioned, they're very similar to each other, except for one process, and that is the heat addition process. And, and I'll describe that more later on. Okay, so something that is common to both of them is that they both use reciprocating pistons in a closed system cylinder. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the mechanics of, a, of, of the auto and the diesel heat engine cycles. Okay, so what do we mean by reciprocating? Well, that just basically means that the piston goes up and down inside a cylinder, right? And uh, so during the cycle, the piston will reciprocate, right, go up and down between a maximum volume, which I have drawn over here on the left-hand side. So this is with the piston at its position to render the maximum volume in the cylinder and a minimum volume. So now the piston is pushed all the way up to the top and now the cylinder has its minimum volume. Okay, so uh, we often call the minimum volume the volume at TDC, which stands for top dead center. In other words, the piston is at its top dead center position. The piston doesn't go any higher than its top dead center position. And when we have maximum volume, uh, we call that the volume at BDC, or bottom dead center. In other words, the piston is at its very lowest position. It can't go any lower than its bottom dead center position. <clears throat> and uh, as the piston moves from bottom dead center to top dead center or from top dead center to bottom dead center, 
we call this the stroke of the piston. Okay, so as the piston reciprocates up and down in the cylinder, it strokes up and down. So again, BDC is bottom dead center, TDC is top dead center. Okay, so based on this information of knowing that the cylinder has a minimum, the, the cycle has a minimum volume and the cycle has a maximum volume, we're going to use those volume, uh, those volumes in two very important definitions. The first definition is what we call the compression ratio. So the ratio between the maximum volume and the minimum volume, which is fixed, these two volumes are fixed, okay, is important. And we call that volume ratio the compression ratio. And we, sub, or we label the compression ratio R sub C. So R, R sub C is defined as V max divided by V min, which if we write it on a specific basis, which is perfectly okay to do, it's little V max divided by little V min. The other important definition is what we call the displaced volume or the displacement volume, or sometimes volume displacement. Uh, the displaced volume is the difference between the maximum volume and the minimum volume. And we label the displaced volume variable as V sub D. And so the displaced volume V sub D is just V max minus V min, or V bottom dead center minus V top dead center. And just like with the compression ratio, we can uh, use little v's here and say that the specific displaced volume is equal to the specific maximum volume minus the specific minimum volume. <laughs> so in general, compression ratio is important because it influences the efficiency of the cycle. Displaced volume is important because it influences the net work or the power of the cycle. Okay, so above I said I wasn't going to say anything else about internal combustion engines. That's only partially true. I do need to interject one small thing here, uh, and that is the following. You know, both of these, in spite of the fact that an IC engine is not a heat engine, there, there is, of course, a lot of, uh, there, there's a lot of connections between he, the, the heat engine cycles and, and the internal combustion engine. And uh, one, of the, one of the overlaps is the definition of compression ratio, and the definition of displaced volume. So an internal combustion engine, uh, or at least a reciprocating internal combustion engine, like a gasoline engine, will have uh, a defined compression ratio, and it will have a defined displaced volume. So for, for those of you that are uh, car enthusiasts or engine enthusiasts, I'm willing to bet you absolutely know the displaced volume of your engine. It could be something as small as uh, you know 1.7 liters, or it could be something as high as you know six or seven liters if you drive one of these big diesel trucks. Back in the day, the good old days, the mindset of engine developers, particularly for automotive automotive applications, was to deliver more power to the consumer by making a bigger engine. That is by delivering a higher displaced volume. In fact, there used to be a, a saying that went, there is no replacement for displacement. If you want power, then give a bigger displacement. And that's actually how engines such as uh, the V8 was designed. Uh, the eight-cylinder engine, of course, if you put eight cylinders in line with each other, that makes for a really long engine under the hood. And the engineers at Ford Motor Company didn't want to do that. They wanted to have a smaller packaged engine to fit under the hood of their of their cars. And so what they did is they took that inline eight engine, uh, excuse me, that inline eight cylinder engine, they sliced it in half and they coupled uh, the one set of four cylinders to the second set of four cylinders in a V pattern and called it a V8 engine. And hence the invention of the V8 engine by Ford Motor Company engineers. And then ever since then, they've, they've come up with different variations of V engines, V6s, V10s, sometimes V12s if you're Rolls-Royce. Uh, and so you have, uh, you have these, these different um, sized engines. But more recently, actually within I'd say about the last 15 years, uh, engine engineers have become much smarter about 
how to increase the power of the engine. And they've realized that you don't have to do it with displacement. In fact, it's actually not all that smart to do it with displacement. It's actually better to do it with things like the efficiency of the engine. So if you increase the efficiency of the engine, you're, also, you know, you're increasing how much work you get out per unit of fuel. So you can increase your power output by increasing efficiency. So many of the modern day designs that we see in advanced internal combustion engines are exploiting this idea as opposed to exploiting this idea. Okay, so that's it for IC engines. Take mean 410 and we'll, we'll talk more about internal combustion engines. Okay, so what are the details of the auto and the diesel cycle now that we have some understanding of, of, the, uh, of, of the volume characteristics and things like compression ratio and displaced volume? Okay, so the, the details of the auto cycle is there are four processes. And the first process, process one to two, is reversible and adiabatic, so it's isentropic, compression from maximum volume to minimum volume. We then have process two to three, which is a constant volume heat addition. And this constant volume heat addition occurs at the minimum volume, which of course is also equal to V2, which is equal to V3. We then have the reversible and adiabatic expansion process from V min to V max. And again, V3 is equal to V min and V4 is equal to V max. And then finally, to close the cycle, we have process four to one, which is a constant volume heat rejection process at maximum volume. And of course, maximum volume in this case is equal to both V4 as well as V1. Okay, what are the details of the diesel cycle? Well, again, the two cycles are very, very similar to each other. There's just one difference, okay? Process one to two is exactly the same. Reversible and adiabatic compression process from V max to V min, this is exactly the same as the auto cycle. V max is equal to V1, V min is equal to V2, just like the auto cycle. This is where we have a difference, process two to three. Okay, process two to three in the diesel cycle is different than process two to three in the auto cycle. In the diesel cycle, process two to three is a constant pressure heat addition process. Okay, constant pressure, not constant volume. So even though the volume at state two is equal to the minimum volume, the volume at state three is not equal to the minimum volume. Volume at state three is going to be somewhere between V min and V max. The pressure at state three, of course, is equal to the pressure at state two because it's a constant pressure heat addition process. Process three to four is in name the same as the auto cycle, but we have to be careful with our volumes. So I'll point that out. So <clears throat> process three to four is a reversible and adiabatic expansion process from V3 to V max. Notice V3 is not the same as V min. So you have to be very careful with that. V max, however, is the same as V4, or I should say V4 is the same as V max. And then finally, process four to one is the same as the, uh, oops, there's a typo here. Um, let me see if I can, I don't know if I can do this. Let's see what my, um, ooh, look at this. Will this work? No. There are no, would you like to? No, definitely not. That would be problematic. Let me see if I can do this. Maybe this will work. So this is constant volume. No, okay, let me, uh, I, can, I can outsmart this thing. I know I can somehow. Let's see here. Okay, we're going to put a call out on this little sticky note. So this should say, this is constant volume, if I can spell correctly, not constant pressure. Sorry. Okay, so uh, process four to one is, so it's the same as the auto cycle. Process four to one is a constant volume. Okay, I want you to go away. How, how do I get rid of you? Go away. Uh, is a constant volume not a constant pressure heat rejection process, okay? Okay, so let me go back into reading mode. Maybe that'll get rid of this screen on the right-hand side. There we go. Okay, cool. 
All right, so how do these two cycles look on the PV diagram? Well, they look like this. And again, I tried to use my red pen here, but I was outsmarted by technology once again. So um, on our pressure volume diagram, we of course can draw on here um, our, oh, by the way, I, before I jump too far into this, notice that I'm drawing the auto and the diesel cycle on PV diagrams as opposed to TS diagrams. It's just because of the fact that we're operating between two fixed volumes and because it's a closed uh, system cycle, uh, it, it just makes more intuitive sense to draw the auto and the diesel cycle on PV diagrams as opposed to TS diagrams. But it would still be a good exercise for you to be able to draw the auto and the diesel cycle on TS diagrams. Okay, so make sure that um, you, you translate this information to a TS diagram. Okay, so if we draw these on the PV diagrams, we go from uh, minimum volume, right, Vmin, to maximum volume. And so if we first of all talk about the auto cycle, we start off here at state one, and we go from state one up to state two. This is our reversible and adiabatic compression process. We then have our constant volume heat addition process from state two to state three. We then have reversible and adiabatic expansion from state three down to state four. And then we have our constant volume heat rejection process from state four down to state one. The diesel cycle looks very similar. We start off at state one and process one to two is the same, reversible and adiabatic uh, compression. Uh, we then have our constant pressure heat addition process from state two to what I call state three prime to separate it from state three of the auto cycle. And notice that the volume at state three prime is not either the minimum volume or the maximum volume. It's somewhere between the two. And the volume at state three prime will depend on how much heat we're adding to the cycle. Uh, V3 prime is a function of the heat addition process. So you won't know where V3 prime is until you uh, analyze uh, the cycle and, and get details about that heat addition process. Uh, three prime to four prime is in name the same as the auto cycle, but of course look how different it is, right? So process three prime to four prime is a reversible and adiabatic expansion process. And then process four prime to one is the same as the auto cycles four to one, a constant volume heat rejection process at maximum volume. Okay, so of course uh, I've summarized here the auto cycle is state one to two to three to four back to one, that's the auto cycle. And the diesel cycle is one to two to three prime to four prime to one. Okay, so the last thing that we need to talk about is how do we actually solve these cycles, right? If, if you're given some information about the auto or the diesel cycle, how do we go about solving them? Well, uh, we can do our process by process analysis, just like what we did with the Carnot cycle and just like what we did with the Rankine cycle. And we didn't do it for the reheat cycle, but uh, I mean, you, you get the gist of, of how to be able to do that for the reheat cycle. But I do want to go through it the, uh, for the auto and the diesel cycles because now we're dealing with um, air and we can model air as an ideal gas, right? So we can use our ideal gas equations for the auto and the diesel cycles, which of course we're not necessarily able to do for the Rankine cycle. So uh, we, we start off with process one to two and you'll notice in parentheses that this is for both cycles, okay? So we're doing this for, this is the same analysis for both cycles. Uh, and we have a reversible and isentropic compression process from the maximum volume to the minimum volume. So we first start with our first law equation. And of course our first law says that the heat transfer Q1 to two minus the work transfer work one to two is equal to the change in internal energy, U2 minus U1. Remember that this is a closed system so we're going to use our closed system first law equation. Well, it's a, it's a, this should say uh, adiabatic here. I need to add another sticky note. Just one moment, please. And, and actually, while I do this, I, I need to make sure that, that this fellow is still recording. Okay, it is. Um, so let me, let me add another sticky note because I've, I've made another mistake. If 
I can move over there. See, this is covering this up. I, I really want this thing to go away. I don't know how to make it go away. Okay, I did something there. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll just add it here. So this is, this should be adiabatic, adiabatic, not isotropic, right? But of course, the process is isentropic since it's reversible and adiabatic. And that makes it isentropic. Okay, so sorry about that again. Another typo. Maybe I am still a little bit jet lagged here. Okay, so uh, that is then our um, process one to two. So since it's adiabatic, Q one to two is equal to zero. So we get that work from one to two <clears throat> work from one to two is equal to U one minus U two. But because this is an ideal gas, air is an ideal gas, we can say delta U is equal to CV delta T. So U1 minus U2 is equal to the constant volume specific heat times T1 minus T2. Okay? Okay, so what does the second law tell us about process 1 to 2? Well, uh, the second law, of course, says that S2 is equal to S1 plus the entropy change due to heat transfer. Uh, plus the entropy generation. Uh, Q over T is uh, zero because it's an adiabatic process, and entropy generation is equal to zero because it's a reversible process. So we get that S2 is equal to S1, reversible and adiabatic, means that it's isentropic, and because it's an ideal gas, we can use our isentropic relationships. So we can say that T2 over T1 is equal to P2 over P1 raised to K minus 1 over K. T2 over T1 is equal to V1 over V2 raised to K minus 1. And P2 over P1 is equal to V1 over V2 raised to K. Now, because for process 1 to 2, we're going from the maximum volume to the minimum volume, right? And the ratio of maximum to minimum volume is defined as the compression ratio we can say that V1 over V2 is equal to V max over V min, which is equal to the compression ratio. So for our T2 over T1 as a function of the volume ratios and our P2 over P1 as a function of the volume ratios, uh, we can substitute compression ratio into those two equations, uh, which gives us a nice simplified form to the uh, auto cycle and diesel cycle process one to two isotropic relationships. Okay, so then let's move on to process two to three, and now we, we have to center our analysis here on just the auto cycle. So for the auto cycle, uh, we of course have constant volume heat addition. So when we do our first law analysis, we get that Q two to three minus work two to three is equal to U three minus U two. It's constant volume, so work two to three is equal to zero. So we get that Q two to three is equal to U three minus U two, which is equal to CV times T3 minus T2 because of the ideal gas behavior. And if you remember that V3 is equal to V2, then you'll have state three fixed. And uh, you'll either be given the heat addition or you'll be given the temperature at state three, or uh, you'll be given uh, some, some means to, you know, you might be given information later in the cycle. You might have to work the cycle backward, for example. But somehow you'll be able to fix your state 3 and calculate the Q2 to 3. <laughs> if we look at um, process 2 to 3 for the diesel cycle, this, of course, is our constant pressure heat addition process. Uh, and so our first law says that Q2 to 3 minus work 2 to 3 is equal to U3 minus U2. And um, now, we don't have a constant volume process, so we can't say work 2 to 3 is equal to 0. Work 2 to 3 is equal to the integral of pressure times the displaced volume, the, excuse me, the change in volume, dV. Uh, since pressure is constant for this process, we pull it out of this integration, and so we get that this is pressure times the integral of dV, and uh, the integral of dV is just V3 minus V2 between states 2 and 3. And so the work transfer for process 2 to 3 is equal to the pressure times V3 minus V2. 
we substitute this into our first law equation and get that Q2 to 3 minus work 2 to 3, pressure times V3 minus V2, is equal to U3 minus U2. Uh, if I bring these terms, the work terms, over to the right-hand side, then we see that we get this combination of U plus PV at state 3 and U plus PV at state 2. Remember that enthalpy is equal to U plus PV. So our heat transfer for this constant pressure process is just the difference in enthalpies between the two states, H3 minus H2. And again, because we're dealing with an ideal gas, delta H of an ideal gas is equal to Cp delta T. So H3 minus H2 is equal to Cp times T3 minus T2. And again, recall that uh, pressure at state 3 is equal to pressure at state 2. Now, of course, there's two ways to calculate the work transfer. You can use this expression up here, pressure times the change in volume. That might be the easiest way to do it. Or you can just go back to your first law equation and say that work 2 to 3 is equal to Q2 to 3 plus U2 minus U3, which, when you do the ideal gas substitution, translates to Cp times T2 minus T3. And then for both the auto cycle and the diesel cycle, just remember that Q2 to 3 is the same as the high temperature heat input, QH. Okay, march and ride along. We then have process three to four. And again, this is for both cycles. So this is, of course, a reversible and adiabatic expansion from our volume at state three to our volume at state four, which for both cycles is equal to the minimum volume. Again, be careful with V3. V3 is equal to the maximum volume for the auto cycle it's not equal to the maximum volume for the diesel cycle. So the first law is uh, Q3 to 4 minus work 3 to 4 is equal to U4 minus U3. It's an adiabatic process, so Q3 to 4 is equal to 0. And we get that work 3 to 4 is equal to U3 minus U4, which is equal to our constant volume specific heat times T3 minus T4, since air is an ideal gas. The second law, of course, when we do the same analysis, we get the same result that we got for process 1 to 2. It's a reversible and adiabatic process, so that means that it's also an isentropic process. And S4 is equal to S3. So we can use our isentropic relationships for the ideal gas, which I've listed here. Okay, And the only thing that you have to be careful about is that for process 1 to 2, we did the substitution for V1 over V2 was equal to the compression ratio. You can do a similar substitution for the auto cycle, since V3 for the auto cycle is equal to V min, and V4 for the auto cycle is equal to V max. So you get V3 over V min, excuse me, V3 over V4, which is equal to V min over V max. So, oops, V3 over V4 is equal to V min over V max, which is 1 over the compression ratio. So for the auto cycle, you can substitute 1 over RC for these volume ratios in these two equations. You cannot do that for the diesel cycle. In the diesel cycle, V3 will not equal V min. And so you can't make that compression ratio substitution in the diesel cycle. Finally, we have process 4 to 1. Uh, and again, this is now for both cycles. And so we have constant volume heat rejection. So our first law equation tells us that Q4 to 1 minus work 4 to 1 is equal to U1 minus U4. Uh, work is equal to 0 because it's a constant volume process. So we get that Q4 to 1 is equal to U1 minus U4, which is equal to the constant volume specific heat times T1 minus T4, since we have an ideal gas. And again, I'll just remind you that uh, Q4 to 1 is equal to negative QL, just like Q4 to 1 for the Rankine cycle was also equal to negative QL. Okay, so now that we know how to do the process by process cycle analysis for both the auto and the diesel cycles, we use this information very similar to how we used it for the Rankine cycle, uh, where we determine now actually two important parameters with the auto and the diesel cycles. So for the Rankine and the reheat cycles, we're really just interested in efficiency. For the diesel and the auto cycles, we're interested in efficiency and one other important parameter, which I'll describe next. So of course, the efficiency is just uh, the same that we've always used. Eta is equal to the network divided by QH, high temperature heat input. 
And uh, just bear in mind that the network for the auto cycle is composed of just two processes, work one to two plus work three to four. And the network for the diesel cycle is actually composed of three processes. Remember, the heat addition process has work transfer associated with it. So the network for the diesel cycle is work one to two plus work two to three plus work three to four. Now, the second parameter that uh, I mentioned is something which we call the mean effective pressure. And this is something that's uniquely defined for reciprocating heat engine cycles. And uh, even though I promised I said I wouldn't bring it up again, uh, just one more time, uh, we also use mean effective pressure very routinely in the internal combustion engine world. And again, the similarity there is the fact that uh, auto and diesel heat engine cycles are reciprocating piston cylinder systems and in intern, you know, uh, things like gasoline and diesel engines are reciprocating piston engine systems. So uh, there, there's a lot of commonality between the two. Anyway, the mean effective pressure uh, is, uh, we, we call it MEP. It's just uh, the creative uh, variable name that we came up with it. And it's just defined as the network divided by the displaced volume. And so when you take the network and you divide it by the displaced volume, you get units of pressure which is why we call it the mean effective pressure. And basically what it is, if, if I just go back up to our PV diagram, the mean effective pressure is essentially the volume averaged pressure in the cycle, right? So if I just kind of were to draw a line through here, something like that, you know, and say, well, maybe that's the volume averaged pressure in the cycle for the diesel cycle, that would be your mean effective pressure. Now, the reason why mean effective pressure is important is because it tells you how good your thermodynamic cycle is in spite of the displaced volume, right? So earlier we said that there is no replacement for displacement. Well, mean effective pressure will, uh, will, will, will out you, okay? So if you're creating more power by increasing your displaced volume, if you divide your power by that displaced volume, your mean effective pressure may actually be lower than other engines that make less power uh, but have smaller displacements. And so again, that gets back to this, you know, mean effective pressure isn't precisely an efficiency, uh, but it's it's the same mentality, right, where you, you want to have as high of a mean effective pressure as possible. What that means is that you can deliver a whole lot of power with a relatively small uh, small packaged engine, small displacement. Okay, well, that's as far as we're going to get. So uh, we finished just a few minutes early, uh, which I, which I uh, know that you won't mind. Uh, we're going to pick up our discussion of the auto cycle on, uh, when we come back together uh, uh, to class on Tuesday. Uh, so you can look forward to that. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. But you actually have now enough information to do the first four problems of your homework set, homework number 11, which is due on Tuesday, December 3rd. So... I encourage you to get it started, maybe even get it finished before uh, leaving for Thanksgiving break. Thanks very much for your time and attention, and uh, I will see you later.